like I can do a few things on my phone, but it's just really crappy for the most part. Sure. And I got a droid too, so you can't really do much really yeah, This is right. Hero Magazine. We're here with MC Carini. Thank you so much. I had a really good time. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Oh, I don't know. I know. I don't get out. I don't get out. Thank you all over me. Are you still going to be right over here? Oh, yeah. Talk to girl. Good. That was me. No. I got a banana in my pocket for you. <laughs> my banana in my pocket. <laughs> this is the Reviewer Magazine. We're here with MC Carini and Angela Picard at the White, White Box Contemporary Art Gallery downtown. And um, Alex was telling me a little bit about your artist in residence uh, background. That you were there for how long? 50 days. Is that a pretty good stint? Did you have a good time? Well, considering they don't usually get more than 30, 50 was, uh, was good and yeah. never a day off. And even when I went home to sleep, I was working on other stuff for the residency and getting ready. So I, I'm going to be sleeping probably the next month to catch up on everything that I lost out on. But did it just end? Like, did it just end right uh, before you had the show or before you put everything up? What's that? The artist in residence uh, time was that, did that end right before you started the. April 10th uh, through May, and then so, yeah, it, it uh... It was a bit of a rollover, actually. So there was, uh, there was like a sparse amount of time that we were just kind of grouping the way we wanted to present the work based on the shows that we do back to back to back, as everyone knows. But in his case, um, Alex and I had talked about it and in some terms, you know, advised him through work and what we thought would make his work grow. And the people that want to collect his work would want to find it more, more collectible even based on the fact that he's showing growth. Not only as an individual, but as an artist with a career as a career artist. Not a hobby, not, uh, not even working. <laughs> just working as an artist so we wanted to elongate the situation of him being in that space which I call the hot box he calls the box and the reason it's the hot box is because it is a sh small small condensed space that you work uh, it was hot that's work. why I was always yeah. naked it was hot like, pragmatic is the way to put it just like consistently and with like a fever and, it's, and it's, he's been a beautiful artist and listening instead of arguing, I mean, maybe he argued on the inside, but he listened and said, this will make my work better, I will try it. And I think it worked, and it's been good for all of us in the sense of having an artist this talented with this much ambition to show other people, do not stop. Isn't that the point? Do, you know do what? not stop. Do not stop, yeah. yeah don't do give stop. up, persevere. No, but do not stop bigger than perseverance or don't quit. You know, we all need to quit sometimes, but do not stop means forge, force, forward. Um, M MC, how would you describe your, the, the style of these works? Alex was telling tell me it was slightly different than what you were doing before the artist-in-residence tenure. Um, how is this different than what you were doing beforehand? I was doing some very uh, inorganic work before, very hard-edged stuff, working on panel, and I wanted to return to sort of a youthful exuberance and sort of go back to the basics of painting, strictly working with the brush and uh, only working with primaries and translucents, blending my secondaries and tertiaries. And I also wanted to really develop relationships with my painting. So I view every painting sort of as a dance where I would go at them very aggressively and just start uh, with the mark and then it's sort of a dance back and forth where something would happen and I'd react to it. And I'd listen to music and, and share in the stories uh, of people entering that would come to visit me at the residency because I'd work uh, sometimes till 4 or 5 in the morning and I'd just keep my door open all the time and let people in. And so all of my pieces were inspired by the interactions that I had here. And so there was a sense of, uh, I don't know if you would really call it regionalism, but in a way I guess it would be, and that it was a completely different environment, uh, having these large open windows, the natural light coming in, uh, having the energy of uh, working in front of people, which I had never done before. And they really helped shape um, some, some different color palettes for me and uh, have a, a different dialogue. Uh, not only with my paintings, but well, with my paintings, but also with myself, and I consider my paintings a, a part of myself. So everything ties into it, and um, so I view them as dance, and just go at them very aggressively, and, and hope to put together a, a beautiful dance for people that could be interpreted um, anyway with uh, with great depth, though.
it's almost like it's almost like uh, doing it in front of a crowd like that in a fishbowl like that is sort yeah. of like performance art. Oh, performance art. Oh, I was a performer. Of, yeah, I, I became a performer. And, and, and that, that would probably affect your style a little bit, wouldn't it? Would, would, it, would, would you take longer? Would you take more time on a on a painting or something, or would you? Do it quicker to move on to the next one? Would it somehow affect your technique? Because of my situation prior to the residency and, and not having a job and, and being close to being homeless, I came in and I dumped everything I had into it and I, I just said I, I need to be aggressive, I need to take risks, and I just aggressively went at it. I didn't overthink it, but I was still very conscious of everything that I was doing and just absorbing everything. And with the residency, it's a very unique experience, so you need to appreciate it for the unique experience it is and take in where you are and, and, and what it is, the, the people down here in this environment. And so I tried to break a few of the rules that I may not have been willing to before when working in, in my space at home. Um, and, and I think that because it was a completely new environment, I was more comfortable in taking those risks and, and breaking out of the box that I was comfortable in. Where was home before the uh, residency program? Uh, my, my studio was up in, uh, in, nor in the North Park area, and I had a second bedroom that was my studio. And when I lost my job, I had to get rid of that, and so I, I don't really have a space to paint anymore. Um, my bedroom's really tiny, and I pretty much have all my stuff stored in there right now, but there's just no room to work. And without this opportunity, I certainly wouldn't have been able to do grand scale works in, in my largest piece ever, my six and a half of my ten foot, um, which I wanted to culminate my experience here with. And since all my pieces here were named after and inspired by individuals I met, I wanted my last piece to sort of have the composition of like a giant eyeball. And it, what I did is I worked in every single color scheme and every person's name into that painting. Um, so that everybody could be a part of that thing and, and it's shaped like an eyeball because it's everybody looking at me inside the box. And that big one? Yep. And yeah. at the same time, it can be viewed as sort of like a black hole. Do you, do you want to give us a little tour and maybe take us over there and explain to us a little bit about the, uh, the yeah, piece? Yeah, do that. Okay, okay. You know, I think it should start with your sensibility of your season and the way that you, you rode through the seasons that weren't uh, seen by most people. Yeah. When he first came, uh, he was kind of riding the tide, as he said, of teetering on homelessness. And when most people give up, it was like I say, do not stop. Giving up is not an option. Art chooses you. You have no choice. And so when it chooses you, you can't wrong her. You owe her something. <laughs> and I think he did a really good job of presenting that through seasons, through conversations of human beings. And here in downtown San Diego, it is a canvas in itself. It's like Al Pacino. Absolutely. I want to get out, but they keep pulling me back in. But you know, you, you, you <laughs> want to be pulled in. I, I adore this neighborhood. I reside here. Yeah. I work here. I, yeah. I live here with my every bit in essence and try to pull everyone to it. And he did the same thing while he was here. He made it his home. I said, this space is yours for this amount of time. Move in. I almost feel more homeless now, even though I have my other place to sleep right now, losing that. I mean, I still walk down here all the time and walk past the space, and I feel like, like I kind of lost my home in a way, and I, I miss it, and I, I, I've thought about moving downtown and, and living down here now, which is something I never would have considered, and I realized it is a small community. And I also realized the importance of uh, educating the public and making even people that feel like they're, they're not trained in art or like they can't be part of the conversation, making them feel welcome and including them. So one of the things I tried to do was... Um, I know how much I appreciated people giving me things when I had nothing, so I'd have people come to visit me and I had a bunch of uh, signed lithographs that were limited editions, so anytime anybody would come in and just say hi to me, um, I did, it didn't matter who they were, I would, I would give them something and so many people were, were surprised but just so appreciative just to, to get something and, and to, it just made them feel appreciated and, and I came to appreciate the people that are down here and realized that it's a small community, saw the same people every day. Uh, now when I come down here, people say hi to me and, and that's... Yeah. Uh, it's really overwhelming in a positive kinda, way, and kinda, there's not one negative experience the entire time from any person. Kind of reaping the, the crop of that, uh, all those seeds of happiness you planted, you know? Well, take us around. Show us who, you can start here, show us something, or, or maybe take us to the big thank one, whichever you, one you Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Angela. Bye-bye. So, um, we're going to start with this one, this nice orange piece. This is uh, bright orange. I was... I was uh, remarking to uh, Alex that this was kind of like, he was telling me that your, your work right now is a little bit happier and it's sort of like the uh, Van Gogh's uh, orange period. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, when being out in public and then having that natural light, um, it really changed the color palettes that I was working with. And, and a lot of times I'll try to 
always be broadening the repertoire of my work, so I'll look at the, the body of work I have and look at what's missing. And I realized I had so many dark pieces, and when you're in there with these huge windows with natural light coming in all day, and you have people coming in and saying just overwhelmingly positive things, you can't help but drift towards those warmer color schemes. And this piece is called A Mandeverance, and this is actually one of the pieces that came about the quickest, and it just naturally developed. It was... I would say it was one of my most successful relationships that I built with the painting, and that it was just so so natural and, and free flowing. And it's not uh, not quite a monochromatic uh, color scheme. It's still somewhat of an analogous color scheme since there's some different oranges and pinks in there. Um, but it's definitely one of my lighter pieces, and, and I wanted to convey sort of a sense of lightness, but also respect with uh, the title of Amandeverance, uh, based on somebody that I met named Amanda. Amandeverance, okay. I don't want to run out of uh, room on this on the SD card, so do you want to walk over to the big one, to the one that is sort of like your centerpiece, yeah. and describe that one to us? This is a pretty big piece. How, how big would you say this is? Six and a half foot by ten foot. Biggest biggest piece I've ever done. Wow. And, it, and it's some sort of a mystic eye or something? In a way, yeah. Um, this was my most ambitious piece, and, and it's the one that I culminated my experience with. Uh, I did a time lapse of it, first time I've ever done one of those. And uh, started with the raw canvas. This one in particular took uh, eight coats of gesso, so I used an entire gallon of gesso just getting it ready. But what this piece was about was it really encompasses the entire experience and all the other paintings. I worked every since every piece that I've done was inspired by people that I met during my residency and the color schemes as well. I brought every one of those color schemes and every one of those individuals into this painting. I wrote everybody's name into this painting that I had interactions with and then worked over them so that you can't see them, but they're part of the underpainting, they're a part of the process, and all of the color schemes as well. It very loosely kind of transitions, uh, almost like a rainbow from yellows to oranges to reds to purples to blues to greens, uh, but in a very subtle way. And compositionally, what I wanted, and I'm glad that they showed it in white box, um, for a number of reasons, but one reason is so people could step far away from this painting and see that it's uh, in a way shaped like a giant eyeball and what it represents is everybody outside looking in at me as I was the boy in the box doing my residency and here we are at White Box uh, showing it and in the same, uh, in the same way it, it also represents uh, a little bit of a, of a black hole where it sucks you in with this flat black and then this uh, energy of, of colors and, and just uh, vibrancy and just dancing around and it was the piece that I was able to get the, the loosest on and because you could just totally get into the motions, the full range of motion of the arm strokes. Uh, even with some of my pieces that were six foot by six foot, you could get a, a full motion if you were standing in the center and get a good circle, but with a piece like this, you could walk around and it was a very physically exhausting piece, almost a, a workout of sorts, and I had to keep it on the ground to work on it, uh, leaned up against the wall because any higher I wouldn't have been able to, to reach certain points. So I tried oh. to... How long would you say it took? I can't really evaluate how long any of my pieces took because I was so involved in everything and so consumed uh, to the point of synesthesia where all my senses were crossing and I was seeing music and hearing color that uh, I was never really aware of how long things were taking. Um, I'd just get so wrapped up in them and eventually I'd step back and I'd say, okay, I think this dance is complete and this is where I need to leave this. Do you work on more than one at the same time, or do you work on one, finish it, then move I've on? I've never been able to because I would feel like it's stepping away from one dance and trying to do multiple dances, trying to do like a jazz dance while doing a contemporary dance, while doing a country line dance, and I feel that in order to give them the proper respect that they deserve, that I need to be fully devoted to the one. Um, now that being said, I'm aware of everything that I've done before and everything that I these other concepts and places I may go, so I still have a definitive shape, and I don't feel like I'm restricted in creating that one painting. But um, that painting has a specific story that needs to be told, and I want to give it the integrity and respect that it deserves while I'm working on it. You use uh, dance um, a lot in your, your metaphors. Do you, are you a trained dancer? Is that your sport, or was that your first never, art? Never, no. but um, 
as I've broken away from the very inorganic work and the tight geometric shapes, one of the things that helped me get away was watching a lot of dance and listening to a lot of music and sort of allowing the uh, natural things in my head to just come about. And um, I think that sometimes you have to lose certain things or, or go through certain things or have certain traumas in order to be able to find that freedom where you've lost everything and you, and you can only go up and you don't have to worry about it anymore and you can just be you. And that's the other reason that I transitioned to this work is because I wanted it to be tumultuous up still but had this youthful exuberance and it was, there was no right or wrong. It was painting like a child again and learning to work with just a brush and just dancing on the canvas letting the colors come about as they want to and listening to the music and having that help me guide me in my stroke as I'm telling my story. We have about 60 uh, seconds left on, on this card. Um, what is uh, next for you, MC Karini, and your next next project? What are, you, what are you planning on? What are you preparing for? What are you moving up to now? I don't know. I, I'm so thankful for, for this experience, and I was so... Uh, everything that I had was put into this experience in every possible way. So what's next, I don't know. It's going to be hard to top this, but um, I just want to say thank you to all of San Diego and all the great people that inspired me because without you, I, this work would not be here. I don't have this work without you because you were, were this work and this is you. This is your night tonight looking out. Awesome. Well, thank you, San Diego, from MC Creaning. Thank you, MC Creaning. Great show. Love your work. Thank you.